And we want to talk about the painting because nobody is talking about dance. Okay. The picture is not there. Yeah, can we move my like put up the poster? Like put put Adira's uh no put the poster. No, she's so, she's on the yes, okay. Are we good to go? Okay, so uh, normally the old and in, in the olden times, four uh, seven minutes past the hour would be the time to start. That was our time. I guess we are uh, well past that too. So let's <laughs> let's really get started. Uh, good afternoon uh, and welcome to this uh, special joint book celebration. My name is Arunab Ghosh. I teach modern Chinese history here at Harvard. Uh, over the next hour and a half. Uh, we'll get to listen and learn about uh, two fascinating new books that explore the literary encounter between China and India. Now, as many of you may know, the study of China and India has witnessed what might be termed a paradigmatic shift over the past decade or two. Uh, the new scholarship that has emerged, uh, much of it by people who are present in the room or perhaps are joining us online, has offered compelling new ways to understand the connected and comparative histories of uh, China and India. These works have collectively expanded what was once uh, a narrow and narrowly conceived set of questions anchored primarily in uh, geopolitical conflict and pursued predominantly by uh, international relations scholars. Uh, the two books we will shortly hear more about are stellar examples, I think, of this paradigmatic uh, change or shift. So our plan today uh, is for each author to speak for about 20 minutes, followed by comments and a moderated discussion before ending with some time for uh, audience questions. Uh, our event, I should say, is generously supported by the Fairbank Center, the Asia Center, the Harvard Yanqing Institute, uh, and NYU Shanghai. So let me uh, very briefly introduce our speakers today. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Adhira Mangalagiri, who is the author of States of Discontent. The Disconnect. China Disconnect. Why did <laughs> I made that point. Thank you. So, so they copied this online and didn't even pay attention. I hope I hope this wasn't uh, a typo somewhere else too. But but uh, thank you for for being so alert. States states of disconnect. Uh, the China India literary literary relation in the twentieth century, uh, which was published in January of this year by Columbia University Press. Uh, Adhira is a lecturer in comparative literature at Queen Mary University of London, uh, working across modern Chinese, Hindi, and Urdu literatures. Uh, she research, uh, her research explores uh, inter the intersections between the Chinese and Indian literary spheres during the modern period. Uh, and she approaches China-India literary comparison, both in terms of contact, which she describes as overlapping, overlapping parts of texts, people, and objects across national borders, uh, as well as in terms of contingency, that is comparative paradigms that bring Chinese and Indian texts together in the absence of actual material contact. In addition to her just published book, she has published in peer-reviewed journals such as China and Asia, Comparative Literature Studies, and the Journal of World Literature. Our second speaker is Dr. Gal Gvili, who is the author of, I hope I'm not going to mess this one up, Imagining India in Modern China, Literary Decolonization and the Imperial Unconscious, 1895 to 1962, uh, which was published late last year, uh, also by Columbia University Press. Gal is an assistant professor in the Department of East Asian Studies at McGill University, where she studies and teaches modern and contemporary Chinese literature. And her interests include China-India literary relations in the modern era, literary theory, post-colonial criticism, gender studies, and religion studies. 
And her work has also appeared in a range of peer-reviewed venues, such as the Journal of Asian Studies, Religions, Comparative Literature Studies, China and Asia, and in an edited volume uh, called Beyond China, Beyond Pan-Asianism, Connecting China and India, 1840s to, 19, uh, to the 1960s, right? I have 1860s type, uh, terrible day today. I think uh, Adira had, a, had an essay in that volume too, actually, right? So, so both of them did. Uh, and of course, uh, our commentator and moderator today uh, is Professor Karen Thornburg, uh, who is the Harry Tuchman Levin Professor in Literature and, and Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations at Harvard. And if I were to try and do full justice to introducing her, we'd be here pretty much all evening. Uh, so I'll merely say that Professor Thornburg's work spans comparative literature and cultural history, world literature, and the literatures and cultures of East Asia, that is China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, as well as the Indian Ocean Rim, South, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa, and most recently, the Pacific Rim, so the Americas, Asia, Oceania, and the global Anglophone. Her research languages include Chinese, French, German, Japanese, and Korean, as well as uh, Hindi, Urdu, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, and also now in, in Indonesian and Swahili. Yeah. She's the author of uh, she's the author of four terrific monographs. Um, uh, the most, I guess, there's one forthcoming: Gender, Justice, and Contemporary Asian Literatures uh, later this year, I think, right? Uh, but also Global Healing, Literature, Advocacy, and Care, which came out in 2020 from Brill. Eco Ambiguity, Environmental Crises, and East Asian Literatures, uh, which was published by Michigan in 2012. Uh, and Empire of Text in Motion, Chinese, Korean, and Taiwanese transcultural transculturations of Japanese literature, published by Harvard in 2009. And as again, many of you know, Eco Ambiguity and Empire of Text in Motion has won have won multiple uh, multiple awards. And I just learned yesterday that she has actually signed uh, a contract for a fifth monograph, which will be published by Bloomsbury, uh, entitled "Narrating Environmental Distress: Stories of Ecological Degradation, Mental Illness, and Inequality." in which she'll explore intersections among environmental degradation, mental health, and inequality. Uh, so congratulations on that. Um, and of course, thank you again for, for everyone here in the audience, as well as those joining us online. Uh, as I noted earlier, uh, following brief about 20 minute presentations from each of our authors, we will turn the floor over to Professor Thornburg for her remarks and for moderating a discussion, both initially with the two authors and then with the audience members uh, here. Uh, just a quick word for those of us who are joining us online, uh, please use uh, the Q&A uh, uh, function to ask your questions. You can, you can type up your questions at any point in the talk, and in the, in the final part of today's event, we'll try and get to them as best as possible also. Okay, so with that done, uh, let me hand things over to Adira. Take us away. I should sit here. Uh, yeah, if, you, if you'd like to, I guess you can. Do I need to share this? Or... Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, uh, Aruna, for the invitation, for organizing this wonderful event. I'm so excited to be here and especially to be part of the discussion with Karen and Gal and um, all of you. Thank you for making it, I understand, over spring break or right after you've landed from the airport for AAS. Um, and online as well. And special thanks to Mark uh, at the Fairbank Center for all of his help and especially the Asia Center for getting me here in the first place. So I wanted to begin by telling you a little bit about how I came to write this book. As an undergraduate student, my first foray into independent research involved tracing affinities and affiliations between the great Chinese writer Lu Xun and his Hindi contemporary Prem Chand. This comparative impulse stemmed from my own experiences of growing up in both China and India. By the time I reached graduate school, I planned to build my doctoral research upon this framework of seeking out affinities between the Chinese and Hindi literary spheres. But then early on in my graduate studies, I made two key discoveries that shifted the course of my research and of my intellectual commitments. The first discovery had to do with Lu Xun, much to my surprise, I learned that Lu Xun, in fact, harbored a lifelong disdain and even hatred for India and Indian literature. In a famous 1908 essay, 
Lushun labels India a shadow nation, Yingguo, a nation stuck in the depths of profound silence, utterly motionless. For Lushun, it seemed as though in the face of India's colonization, its writers were not writing revolutionary literature, but seemed only instead to be pandering to British standards of literature. The main Indian writer Lushun had access to was the celebrated Indian Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore, who famously visited China in 1924. Unlike many of his peers, Lushun was not a fan of Tagore. Tagore's Nobel Prize, which was the ultimate stamp of Western approval, immediately made him suspect. And Lushun found Tagore's talk of Eastern spirituality too regressive for China's modernizing needs. In 27, Lushun said in a speech, let us try to think of those people who are now voice, voice, voiceless. In India, other than Tagore's, is there any other voice? In the Chula Tiger, Bia the Shangyin Ka Hayo. These are two instances of a handful of mentions of India peppered across Lushun's oof, which indicate that Lushun thought of Indian literature as non-revolutionary, silent, and therefore not worth reading or translating. Of course, this opinion indicates more so Lushun's lack of access to Indian literature and the colonial politics of translation and mediation than it does the actual state of Indian literature of the time. But given Lushun's views, it seemed antithetical to his own practice for me to draw out affinities with those writers he actively tried to distance himself from. The second formative discovery I made was of the figure of the Indian policeman in early 20th century Chinese literature. Indian policemen were stationed in semi-colonial Shanghai and other treaty ports by the British. In Chinese texts, the Indian policeman comes up time and again as a singularly hated figure. He was called Wang Wanu, meaning colonized slave. Chinese citizens saw the Indian policeman as passive, blindly following the colonizers, often violent orders. A trove of Chinese texts depict the Indian policeman as a much hated antagonist in hostile and even racist terms. To share just one small example, here is a 1913 poem Chao Yin Du Shun Bu, mocking the Indian policeman. His face as dark as coal, stupid like cattle. He stands shamelessly before us, such a huge, tall, strong man. Yet now his nation has fallen and he is only a slave. Reading Chinese texts of the Indian policeman took me further away from my initial interest in affinity and affiliation. I was drawn instead to the challenge of thinking ideas of China and India together in moments of distance, of disavowal and hatred. This is not to say that such expression constitutes the norm of how Chinese and Indian writers engaged with ideas of China and India or with historical actors from China and India in the 20th century. Indeed, the many writings that think China and India together in gestures of collaboration, emulation, admiration, are better known and are perhaps more readily studied. This focus on narratives of affinity and affiliation, I argue, is no coincidence. In the book, I identify three main reasons why literary studies and the humanities more broadly have tended to lean towards such narratives. The first reason can be termed blame the colonizer. One result of the incredibly important and influential post-colonial intervention in the 1980s and 90s was a critical attunement to the unequal power dynamics at play when dealing with the histories and legacies of colonialism and empire. The humanist's ability to discern epistemological and representational violence became well honed when identifying vertical fault lines, such as oppressor, oppressed, colonizer, colonized, or epistemological center and marginalized periphery. In contrast, when the colonizer is removed or temporarily bracketed away from the equation, when there are multiple colonized subjectivities or multiple souths, literary scholars have tended to default to frames of horizontality, such as affinity, solidarity, collaboration, partnership, and so on. The second tendency involves a larger pattern of scholarly attention that assigns the study of friendly connection to the humanities and of conflict to the political sciences. This pattern is particularly pronounced in China-India studies, wherein a discourse of tensions predominates the rhetoric of international relations. Humanists have worked to furnish accounts of affinity, exchange, collaboration, and so on as correctives to that overwhelming focus on political tension and conflict, but doing so has created a division of academic labor. 
where narratives of conflict get assigned to the political scientists and those of affinity to the humanists. The risk of this pattern is that the literary critical ability to grapple with conflict and friction productively remains underdeveloped. In the book, I ask what happens when we reverse this division of intellectual labor, when we approach antagonistic political relations as matters of literary concern. The final reason behind why I see literary studies as tending to, toward narratives of affinity and affiliation has to do with logics of late 20th century, early 21st century globalization. In comparative literature, this moment gave rise to a new subfield, often termed new world literature, a field that has been criticized for modeling itself methodologically on the processes of globalization. Efforts to make comparative literature more inclusive and diverse risk recreating in criticism the workings of globalized connectivity, which are characterized by the uneven and exploitative movements of capital. Peng Chia has described this as, quote, the allure of the market metaphor for understanding literature's worldliness. The problem is that regardless of whether a work of world literary scholarship is explicitly studying the flaws of neoliberal globalization, its underlying tendency to seek out connectedness betrays a reliance upon the logics of globalization, which summon visions of the world as an interconnected totality. These are visions of the world not only as infinitely interconnected, but as happily interconnected. The more connection, the better, for this is the logic required to sustain global markets. Herein lies the slippage between connection and affinity. The focus on connectivity in world literary studies often risks taking on the tone of neoliberal globalization by championing connection as a form of affinity and affiliation. Hostile forms of relating across national borders could threaten the survival and expansion of the global marketplace, and so the tone is upbeat. These intellectual concerns inform my conceptualization of disconnect. I use the term disconnect to name crises of transnational relation, perceptible in moments when the national other becomes vilified, disavowed, or remains out of reach. As the book's title indicates, the unit of difference I study is the nation state. My work examines moments when the state overdetermines being to such an extent that gaining access to or relating with national others ethically becomes difficult, even impossible. Importantly, I do not conceptualize disconnect as the antonym or opposite of connection writ large. Indeed, the Chinese and Hindi texts I study engage in China-India comparison. They actively think ideas of China and India together, but they do so not to uphold and champion the China-India pairing, but rather to contemplate the fissures and impossibilities of that pairing. The challenge is to read such moments not as eroding transnational relation, but as offering new forms of relation that stand against the logics of both globalized connectivity and insular nationalisms. Texts of disconnect can be uncomfortable, like the poem about the Indian policeman, but I argue that it is important to consciously take up such expression, given our current social and political climates, in which for large populations around the world, relating with a national other has become less an expression of affinity or solidarity and is more so a gesture of distancing. What can literary criticism do in the face of this reality? How can literary work offer ways to relate with national others precisely when ethical relations seems out of hand, precisely when the world turns hostile? My main argument in the book is this. Texts of disconnect may seem at first to suggest a breakdown of transnational relation, but when read as meditations on literary concerns, such as translation, interpretation, signification, these texts can open possibilities for relating ethically across national borders precisely in moments of violence, silence, and enforced divisions. What are these texts of disconnect? The book's archive draws from Hindi and Chinese literary spheres of the early 1900s to the mid 1960s. The book begins in chapter one with Chinese literary portrayals of the Indian policeman read in the context of late Qing and early Republican era literary debates. Chapter two turns to the Hindi writer Agye who wrote China into his short stories as a meditation on the failures of Marxist solidarity. Chapter three studies 1950s China-India cultural diplomacy 
focusing on moments when the mechanisms of cultural di diplomacy malfunction and break down. And chapter four turns to the 62 China India war. The last chapter is a little bit of an ode to my younger self. The undergraduate thesis I once <laughs> attempted on Lushan and Prem Chen appears here in very different form after a decade or so of rethinking. I'll now give you a brief example of what reading for Disconnect looks like in practice. And this draws mainly from chapter four. As is well known, the 1950s marked an era of cultural diplomacy and state declared friendship between China and India. In 62, however, longstanding territorial disputes erupted into a deadly war in the contested border region. As the war unfolded, an outpouring of Hindi texts engaged ideas of China, but these were not the songs of friendship that had rung out in the 50s. Now the literary sphere became consumed with China as a traitor, a cultural ally turned enemy. Hindi writings took on a patriotic, xenophobic, racist tenor. It was in this context that a curious poem appeared in the Hindi magazine Dharmyog's Pages. It was published under the title Chin, China, and the poet's name was given only in initials, Prama, an anonymous poet whose identity, in fact, I will soon reveal. <laughs> in translation, the, poet, the poem reads, in part, I saw swelling over the horizon such a big dragon. Seeing this, I placed the sword of a solemn pledge upon its chest and vowed, this mighty snake in the sky is lair. Until I crush it, I will not rest. And with this mighty message, like a messenger on the run, I ran. And upon reaching there into the embrace of my loath, I thrust the sword and standing upon that border, we were both numb, benumbed by fury. The poem immediately announces itself as evoking the war. The image of the dragon looming over the horizon invokes the then commonplace trope of China casting its expansionist gaze over India. The hero raises his sword, echoing the nationalist outcry for war that the war had unleashed for India to shed its nonviolent garb of anti-colonial struggle and to defend its freedom with military might. Proclaiming a vow to fight for the nation, a hero goes on a quest to slay the dragon on the border. Read in this vein, the poem falls in line with the wartime tenor of writing China in India, and especially in Hindi. Yet the reader detects a hint of irony. On the page, the poem's title appeared sandwiched between two lines, a parody on top and in parentheses below with apologies to Mr. Shamshir. To clarify this allusion, Dharmyuk printed the poem alongside the text it references, a poem also entitled China by the famous Hindi poet Shamshir Bahadur Singh. So on the slide here, the parody is on the right and the poem it is parodying is on the left shamshir's china shamshir's poem was published in 1959 and features large hand-drawn chinese characters running down its left margin the poem will now seem familiar to you so i'll read only a few of the verses i saw blooming on the horizon such a big flower that flower in the sky is parting, until I kiss it, I will not rest. And with this mighty message, like a messenger on the run, I ran. And upon reaching there, I embraced my love and standing upon that border, we were both happy. The characters in the margins read Zhonghua Renmin Gong Hao Kuo, the People's Republic of China, the name of the new Chinese nation established in 1949. Shamsher's poetic use of the Chinese characters immediately calls to mind Ezra Pound, a source of much influence on Shamsher. Mm -hmm. But unlike in Pound's poetry, the Chinese characters here serve not as sources of ideogrammic inspiration, but rather as the object of the hero's quest, the lover toward whom he runs. This poem, the poem bespeaks the excitement for Indian leftists, Shamsher among them, of witnessing a red nation blooming over the horizon a possible path alternative to that paved by the capitalist imperialist world. As China and India enter into autonomous nationhood, the two lovers embrace, together heralding a new world order at the height of China-India friendship. Prama's parody recreates 
much of Shamsher's poem, but crucially replaces 20 of Shamsher's 126 words mm -hmm. and thereby changes the meaning of the poem entirely. You can see some of the replaced words here. For instance, Shamsher's flower becomes in the parody a dragon. In the detective story version of this talk, in which I set out to inves investigate the anonymous poet's identity. The clue that unravels the whole mystery is indeed the poetic trick at play here, the sleight of hand that replaces the fewest possible words to effect the largest possible change in meaning. Elsewhere in the same magazine, Dharmyuk's pages, this trick reappears, this time as a translation game. An article published under the title Traits of Treachery in Modern Chinese Poetry. Adhunik Chini Kavita Me Bheria Vritis, like literally wolf like characteristics. Um, this article presents what it claims are Chinese poems that reveal China's innate and long standing hunger for war. The article provides Hindi translations of excerpts from 10 Chinese poems, all of which elucidate, according to the author translator, China's warmongering and expansionist ambitions. The Chinese poems are translated from English translations by Rui Ali, who some of you may know as the famous friend of China. The telltale poetic game is afoot here too. The Hindi translation of one poem reads, our soldiers advance, red eyes gleaming. This is actually a translation of I Ching's 1953 poem um, right. written about Chinese soldiers who fought in the Korean War. In Ali's English translation, the soldiers are portrayed as returning home, not advancing forward, their eyes a little bloodshot. The image is clearer still in the Chinese threads of eyes and threads of blood in his eyes from a lack of sleep, very far from the menacing red eyes of Lal Lal Anke. In another line, the Hindi translation reads, I know that when the red flag waves above the world, a new day will dawn. The Chinese, a 1949 poem by Tian Jian, reads a bright new world now on our shoulders, knowing that only when the red flag waves can the new day be surely born. It's a poem commemorating the establishment of the PRC in 49. The Hindi edition of the phase above the world, Dunia Par, is a subtle change from the Chinese, Iga Shin the Shi Jie, Zheng Zai Woman, Jian Shang. But this small change transforms the poem from a celebration of the establishment of the PRC into now expressing China's expansionist desires to take over the world. This article was in fact published with the author's name, Prabhakar Machwe, a well-known Hindi poet, uh, also known as Prama, who was friends with Shamsher, the poet whose poem he parodied, and was himself of leftist inclination through the 1950s. After the 62 war, however, he published a slew of anti-China writings, patriotic um, literature, and so on. In one sense, Machwe's translation of Chinese translations of Chinese poetry can be understood as blatantly irresponsible mistranslation. We may be tempted to turn away from such uncomfortable, unethical texts to not consider them worthy of serious literary analysis. But contrary to this attitude, I want to suggest that it is only through serious literary analysis that we can undo the violence of such expression from within. Ignoring such te texts risks leaving them standing in place and risks giving virulent nationalism the final word. How then can we understand Machwe's writing as texts of disconnect? texts that overtly vilify the national other, but when subjected to literary criticism, texts that can hold open the potential for ethical relation with that other. Again, the clue lies in Machwe's poetic trick. The trick, I want to suggest, plays with signification, opening up a contemplation on the linguistic sign in a world at war. Let me explain briefly. In India, following the 62 war, the perceived betrayal of a brother turned traitor precipitated a crisis of faith in the world and at its fundamental core in the word. If an entire nation could be betrayed, could not the word, the text, deceive? 
The 62 war coincided with a longer concern over signification in Hindi literature. Hindi literary production had turned away from social realism of the pre-independence period toward modernist experimentation in the 50s in the wake of the trauma and violence of partition. A part of this wider modernist loss of faith in meaning's stability, Machve's poetic trick throws into question the fidelity of the word. As a battle over fixing the nation's territorial borders unfolded on the front lines, Machve reveals a struggle of fixing meaning in a world that had suddenly become untrustworthy. The parody destroys Shamsher's world of certainty in which signifier and signified for Shamsher, China and India were inextricably bound together in that embrace. Machwe's rewriting therefore proves doubly parodic. It issues a critique of how easily in just 20 words, the earlier discourse of friendship with China had now turned into hatred. Through the simple economy of its trick, the poem reveals the fickle political alignments of the Hindi literary sphere. The poem chastises the Indian reader who so quickly, so easily can turn to hatred for China after singing songs of friendship just a few years prior. The poem is thus a critique of the very discourse it seems to voice. To return to Disconnect, I hope to have shown how turning toward precisely those moments of transnational crisis when the state overdetermines relation with national others can in fact offer ethical forms of transnational relation. As the case of Machve suggests, Engaging hostilely with ideas of China afforded Indian writers and readers a contemplation on literature's capacity to be read multiply in a parochial wartime climate that insisted on fixing literary meaning and on recruiting literature narrowly in service of the nation's violence. When understood as a matter of literary concern, China's presence as the reviled other becomes undone to reveal its indispensability to Hindi literary experiments with grasping meaning. I hope to have modeled how we can use literary criticism to undo the violence of insular expression from within. Reading texts of disconnect from the past, I want to suggest, can hold important lessons for conceptualizing national being in the present and for the importance of literary work in such conceptualizations far beyond the case of China and India. Thank you, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. I'm just going to find the keynote. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. This was fast. All right, great. Um, so I too would like to thank uh, Aranab very much for organizing this event and to Professor Karen Thornburg for moderating. Uh, thank you so much for to both for your time and generosity. And thank you also to Mark Grady and the Fairback Center for Chinese Studies for their sponsorship and to the Harvard University Asia Center, Harvard Yanjing Institute, and the Center for Global Asia at NYU Shanghai for this very kind invitation uh, to share the stage with my, my, my great friend and interlocutor, uh, Adira. So I'm here today to tell you a little bit about uh, my book, which title you can uh, see here, and which, uh, as was pointed out, was also recently published. So what I'll do today is I'll, I'll start with a, a little vignette from the book's introduction, uh, and that will let, allow me to build towards uh, the argument and the intervention that the book is, uh, is trying to make. And I'll follow this with a very quick example from chapter one of the book. And I hope that in this short time, I'll be able to entice some of you uh, to read more. I'm not going to talk about the structure or the chapters, the different chapters, but I'm happy to uh, get into that if we'll have time uh, in the Q&A. So uh, to start, this is how the book's introduction begins. So this is kind of the, the, the opening. In 1924, one of the leaders of the May 4th movement, Zhang Zhengduo, begins to compose his most important work to date, an outline of literature, Wen Xue Daka. In this three volume work, Zheng launches the study of world literature in China and coins the Chinese term for it, Shi Jie Wen Xue. By composing these volumes, Zheng Zhengduo actively participated in a transnational discourse about world literature, a new concept then, uh, which inception has often been attributed to Goethe in the 19th century. 
The conversation over world literature that Jung is participating in viewed certain works of literature as universal expressions of humanity that as such can be found all over the world. Practitioners of this new field selected and anthologized works in translation, mostly from English, that hailed from across Europe and to an extent from what was then called the Far and Near East, uh, and kind of, kind of anthologizing all of them into a new canon of literature of the world. Zhang Zhengduo modeled his study on such English language collections as John Macy, uh, The Story of the World Literature, and John Drinkwater, The Outline of Literature. So he's citing extensively from these two sources as well, um, but with one major difference. The books that Zhang uh, has consulted dedicated about 10 pages in total to Asian literatures, and they all collapsed China, Japan, and India under titles such as The Mysterious East and Sacred Books of the East, a, a very beloved title. Zhang Zhengduo, on the other hand, composed substantial chapters on Chinese literary history and wrote at length about Vedic and Buddhist scriptures, including a separate chapter on the two Sanskrit epics, Mahabharata and Ramayana. Making a distinct intervention in the Anglophone field of world literature, Zhang Zhengduo's project essentially wrote the literatures of China and India into the canon. And yet, as I discovered when I began to actually read the chapters he wrote on India more closely, undoing the Eurocentric canonization of world literature was not that easy. Unlike the chapters he wrote on Chinese literature, which rely on primary sources, Zhang's engagement with Indian text was heavily mediated through English language translations and scholarship. The English scholarship that Zhang consulted discussed Vedic literature within the parameters of British uh, and German Orientalism and philological study. Zhang followed this scholarship and inevitably repeated its mistakes and biases. He employed, for example, problematic terminology such as the Vedas of the Brahmas and made factual mistakes. So for example, he dubbed the Ramayana and Mahabharata the oldest literary works in the world. Indeed, Zheng defiantly rewrote world literature to pivot what today might be considered literatures from the global south. And yet his study is nevertheless marked by the mediation of the north and its authority over translation and scholarship. Zheng Zhengduo's reaching out to India to assert an Asian world literature is one example of the story that my book tells, how modern Chinese writers imagined India in order to undo imperialist knowledge and how this imaginary came into existence through a constant struggle against the imperial hold on the mind. So this is a partial list of, of you know, very seminal studies on the formation of modern Chinese literature. And these studies uh, describe the birth of modern Chinese literature and culture as a process of translating, interpreting, and adapting European thought and literature, mainly Russian, French, Anglo-American, uh, by way of and in profound conversation with Japanese translation literature and scholarship. So Japan emerges in these studies as both a mediator and a critical interlocutor for Chinese writers. My book seeks to contribute to this list by broadening the geographic trajectory. I show that thinking and writing about South Asia was central for the formation of ideas about what modern literature is and how it should be written. And I do this by examining the imagination of India in the writings of very prominent Chinese writers from the late Qing and until the 1950s. When I started this research, I wanted to show, interestingly, much like uh, Adira's, a very similar story to Adira's, I wanted to show not only that India mattered for Chinese writers, but that it mattered for a particular reason. I had this idea of a horizontal model. Uh, I too had this idea of a horizontal model, which sought not, you know, not hierarchy, but collaboration. It's a very nice fantasy. Um, and I kept finding evidence in critical writing, fiction, and poetry that Chinese writers read pre-modern and modern Indian literature and thought in hopes of resisting Western colonialism by attacking its epistemological foundation. I was very interested in Pan-Asianism broadly and specifically in the rise of the East as a discursive category that challenged Western positivism. And while many late uh, 19th century Chinese writers saw in colonial India a warning sign, you know, this could happen to China if we're not careful, 
Others envision India as a bosom friend with a shared past of religious and cultural exchange, especially because of Buddhism and the shared presence in which both countries suffer under the yoke of imperialism. So I was very lucky to begin thinking about this seriously, right as the field of China-India connections has started to flourish. And you can see here some recent works uh, that I'm very proud to consider this book joining. On my end, I initially wanted to study the affinity that Chinese writers felt towards their Indian counterparts within the recent turn to global South studies and the humanities in general and literary studies in particular. Um, to put it shortly uh, or, or simply, I was excited by the following question. How does a mutual, mutual experience of imperialist oppression shape literary exchange? And particularly, I had intended to study how solidarity networks from the global south shaped anti-colonial struggle in new Chinese literature of the 20th century. But once I examined this partnership closely, when I began to pay close attention to the China-India solidarity that my writers were obviously feeling and imagining, like uh, the example I just showed from Zheng Zhangduo, I came across an obstacle to my original argument or original thinking. I started working on this book thinking that I'm researching how South-South imagination informed Chinese literature. But when I interrogated what this promise of a South-South camaraderie symbolized for many Chinese writers, I realized that the vast majority of Chinese intellectuals in the early 20th century did not speak nor read Indian languages and vice versa. To build their knowledge of India, indeed to reach out to India for a global South imaginary, most Chinese writers, though not all of them, had to consult English language translations and Orientalist scholarship, which came with their own agendas. So this is the larger problem in post-colonial scholarship and comparative literature that the book grapples with. What do you do when you want to form solidarity with another colonized people, but to do that, you must pass through the colonizing language? This problem that Chinese writers dealt with was not unfamiliar to me because to my misfortune, like them, I too do not speak or read Indian languages. English also mediated my encounter with the text that my writers were reading. And so working on this book compelled me to read very broadly about the origin of certain terms and certain theories that appear in Chinese writings. I had to become very suspicious of everything I read and to try and, and kind of trace where these terms come from, only to find out that these terms often derive from European scholarship. The framework I developed in the book to understand how mediated translation uh, shapes global South exchange is what I call uh, South North South. And if I can just plug uh, our forthcoming panel in AAS in, uh, in two days, we're actually have it, we're gonna have a panel on relay translation and indirect translation to Chinese um, because four books came out about this this year. Um, so this is going to be on Friday at 9 a.m. Please come see us. Um, I argue in the book that the contested yet continued shadow of the North, in my case of English language, is an inescapable mediation built into the history of South-South interactions in the modern and contemporary time. Importantly, reading the Chinese imagination of India as an instance of South-North-South exchange, a collaboration that is indelibly marked by what I call the imperial unconscious, does not render meaningless the genuine solidarity and connectivity Chinese writers felt towards India, nor the body of literature they produced that speaks to this affinity. Rather, my book acknowledges the undeniable historical realities against which South-South possibilities were imagined. The literary readings it offers interrogate and bring to light how difficult it is to truly decolonize literature by delineating a new history of the struggle to do just that. So I'll conclude with a brief example drawn from a preface to a poetry anthology by the late Qing writer Su Manshu. Um, I use that in the first chapter of the book and I, I chose it today because Su Manshu was uh, himself keenly aware of the colonial mediation in the work of translation. So it's a good example to show how the imperial unconscious sometimes become conscious, at least in some works and how you read to sort of find these traces. 
So Manchu was born in 1884 in Yokohama, Japan. Uh, I'm sure many people here in the room are very familiar with his work. He was born to a Chinese father and a Japanese mother. He spent the first decades of the 20th century residing intermittently in Japan and traveling to South uh, in Southeast Asia often. He studied Sanskrit um, in, in various places, among them in Thailand. Su was versed in Chinese, Japanese, English, and Sanskrit. And he was one of the first translators of European and Indian literatures to Chinese at a critical time of the transition from Lei Qing to the Republican era, where translation played a key role in shaping new literature. Su Manchu's fiction and poetry present a, a really interesting tapestry of languages with Sanskrit, Chinese, and English words appearing together in different scripts or in transliteration. Often, he used translated poems as part of dialogues in his stories and novella. For this reason, scholars often study Su Manchu as a quintessential Leitian cosmopolitan, this kind of inventor of male subjectivity uh, in modern Chinese fiction. But the translingualism of Su Manchu's writing also bespeaks a view of translation work as a practice that shines a light on power imbalances in geopolitics. His study of and translation from Sanskrit, for example, underscored not only deep commitment to Buddhist revivalism, but also to India's anti-colonial struggle, which he promoted and discussed in several solidarity societies in which he was a member in Tokyo. In my book chapter, I discuss Su Manchu's editorial practices, his composition of an eight volume work on Sanskrit grammar and his fiction. Today, I'll give just one example that I hope will tease out some of his ideas on the meaning of literary translation as a practice that is interconnected with imperialism and marked by hegemonic languages. So in 1908, Sue edited and published an anthology that he titled Literary Relations. This anthology paired English translations of Chinese classics done by British and American missionaries and diplomats, people like James Legg, uh, Herbert A. Giles, and George D. Candlin, with translations to Chinese of English romantic poetry made by Su Manchu and his colleagues, so Byron uh, uh, and Shelley and others. To these, Su also added a translation he did from English of a well-known epigram that Goethe wrote to celebrate the Sanskrit drama Shakuntala a fifth century classic that during the 19th century became one of the first global bestsellers across Europe. The juxtaposition of English language translations of Chinese classical poetry with Chinese translation of English poetry invokes one type of literary relations or connections between the crown jewels of Chinese literature, Tang poetry and the Shizing, and milestones in English romanticism. The inclusion in this anthology of Goethe's epigram, however, is curious. What is a relay translation from English of a German text about an Indian drama doing in a Chinese English English Chinese anthology? One could make the case that Goethe meshes very well with the romantic inclination of the British section of the anthology. Yet, by retranslating an epigram written to commemorate a Sanskrit drama, in which, as Su Manchu knew well, speaks for German 19th century fascination with India in general and with Sanskrit theater in particular. Su does more than showcasing romantic literature or romantic sensibility. In this editorial choice, Su Manchu opens up the meaning of literary relations, which give this anthology its title, to include, along with Qing and the British empires, India, represented by the celebrated Sanskrit drama in retranslation. The preface he composed to the anthology makes this move apparent. Su Manchu's preface. Uh, this is part of it here, um, it veers with almost no transitions from discussing the, context, the contents of the anthology and biographic information about the various translators to lengthy passages about Sanskrit language and masterpieces of Indian culture. So sentences uh, such as James Legg translated the Book of Odes in full are preceded by uh, sentences such as, of all the languages of the world, none matches Sanskrit in beauty. Sue discusses the poet Byron and then immediately transition to the content of the drama Shakuntala. 
The preface to this Chinese English poetry anthology concludes disjointedly with a vignette recollecting a boat trip at sunset after visiting the ruins of an ancient pagoda in Sri Lanka. So he's recalling his own trip in which finally Su cites one of his own poems commemorating this pagoda. The logic behind the narrative disconnect Su embeds in the preface, a logic that inserts discussions on India and Sanskrit repeatedly into a debate over Chinese English and English Chinese translations reveals a particular understanding of the translation act. The title of the collection gives us a clue. Okay. Let's show this again. So the title gives us a clue, right? It situates literary relations between not two, but more than three languages, Chinese, English, Sanskrit, and of course, German in the background. These languages had been bounded together in recent history because of Western imperialism. Of course, relations in Yuan had become a cliche trope, but it's worth thinking about its original meaning, especially in light of Su Manchu's life path as a Buddhist monk. Inyuan is a Buddhist term that denotes the idea of causes, yin and conditions, Yuan, of a certain outcome and indexes as such the Buddhist central idea of karma, a chain of events where one impacts the creation of another. The title literary relations thus invokes a particular understanding of translation as chain of events that are connected by cause and effect. The appearance of Sanskrit and Indian scenery in the preface thus finally asserts literary relations between Chinese and English literatures are bound to extend to India because of its colonization by England, which in turn shaped China's encounter with the British Empire and with colonial India. Translation is enabled by and creates literary relation in a broad sense, a chain of causes and results that shapes history and in it, what gets translated, what gets edited, what gets write, written, and how. Thank you. So, thank you. Great. Great. So, thank you um, so much for um, your remarks, Anita and Gal. And I just, um, it was such a pleasure to return to your books. Um, after not actually so much time having passed first reading them, but this was a great excuse. And it's just wonderful to have two China-India literature relation books uh, come out in the same year. I think that's the first, it's a first, right? We, we haven't had that before. Um, and I'm just so impressed for a number of reasons. I think these books provide us uh, with new models for scholarship, new paradigms, new ways of questioning, thinking about early 20th century, mid 20th century, Asian literatures, world literatures, uh, global literatures, and so forth. They also provide us with new methodologies that, and this is gonna be one of, one of my questions, I hope we can uh, talk about a bit more, you know, how can we engage with these methodologies that you both are developing beyond India, China, which is already a huge field, but I wouldn't like to see this just limited, right, to, to India and China. I think another thing that really came out in our presenters' remarks today uh, was the importance of intellectual flexibility. I loved how you both um, shared with us part of your intellectual journey. And, you know, this is what I came into grad school to do. This is what I'd done in college. And this is how I started having all these questions. Because I think sometimes, particularly pressure of time and funding and so forth, whether it's for our dissertations, whether it's for book projects, um, you know, sometimes we can feel a bit hemmed in, like, well, this is what I promised to do, so I better do it. And, um, you know, that, I guess sometimes one has to do that, maybe. Um, but I think it's much more important to remain really intellectually flexible and really go where the materials take you. And sometimes that's in very, very different directions. And it's harder that way certainly harder, particularly when you're engaging in disconnections that um, others may not agree with initially um, or think worthy of, of time or attention, literary time or attention. You know, I love how in your work, uh, you both are dealing with what, you know, conventionally is called very serious literature, uh, but also with works that may not in more conventional settings sort of rise to that standard. You're saying, hey, you know, this, we have to look at a much broader range of materials. 
Um, so those are some of the, just speaking really broadly, some of the new things I see coming out of, of these, these studies. And I have to say, it's so refreshing uh, to hear this when I was doing my work now, you know, 20 years ago, including Japan in any kind of, you know, early 20th century comparative literary work, unless it was Japan vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular European country, mm -hmm. was seen as, well, no, there's nothing there, right? And now it's just so, like, well, of course, you know, we take it for granted. And I hope it doesn't take that long um, for these new paradigms to reach that stage of, well, of course, this is how we think. We think broadly, because I think there's so many more um, borders and structures that we can transcend if we just give ourselves the intellectual space to do so. So um, just for the purposes that I'm aware of our time here, and I don't want to speak for very long because we have the authors of these two amazing books here who, who should be doing the talking. So what I'm going to be doing um, is just raising like four sort of broad points slash concepts slash questions that um, you each can answer however you would like. You don't have to address all uh, by any means, um, but these are some of the things that struck me uh, both reading your books, rereading your books, and um, just listening to your presentations today. And so um, the first, and I, I owe these insights primarily to my uh, colleague, David Wong, who, as many of you know, is a leading figure of uh, Chinese literature. Um, and uh, one of the things that um, uh, Professor Wong has has noted, not only with, with uh, these two books, but other um, other studies of China, modern China, India, is that we tend to take an approach that uh, might seem to downplay um, some of the uh, earlier so cultural, literary, religious interactions um, and, you know, focusing uh, primarily on the political implications of literary events. I think we saw some terrific examples of that here. Um, but not focusing perhaps as much as we might on the important dialogue between modernity and antiquity. So think, for instance, of Lu Xun's uh, work, uh, Power of Mara Poetry, uh, for instance, which was inspired by ancient uh, Indian uh, mythology. And of course, Lu Xun really uh, twists that mythology around and, and transculturates it in, in many different ways. Um, but, you know, he did have this fascination or this interest, I guess I would just say, in uh, early Indian mythology. So how do we account for that? How do we account um, for individuals uh, such as um, Xu Fan Cheng, who was a translator of Sanskrit, right? Um, how do we account for the work of, say, someone like uh, Shen Songwen? who was inspired uh, by medieval um, Chinese tales that were themselves inspired by early Indian texts. In other words, in addition to all the dynamics that, that you both pointed out, I thought uh, really eloquently, there are uh, Chinese um, intellectuals who are interested, uh, early 20th century, uh, mid and mid 20th century Chinese intellectuals who are interested in, in early India. So how do we, how do how do those uh, connections or disconnection? I don't want to use that word disconnect because it's become so loaded here in this context in a good way, in a good way. Um, but how how do we incorporate those stories into the narratives that that, that you both? Um, again, have outlined so eloquently. So that's the first uh, point. The second point uh, is much more succinct in, in most languages, right? Um, so as, as Gal uh, points out, you know, so <laughs> correctly, right, a lot of the, or in fact, most of the Chinese intellectuals with whom we're dealing here um, do not have facility with Indian languages. There are a few uh, experts in Sanskrit, to be sure, but most don't. So it's it's mediated uh, relay translations uh, and and so forth. Um, but I wonder uh, how things work. I don't want to say in reverse, but other dynamics. And I know and here we've talked about this. Um, if we if we do look uh, beyond Indian writings in English or even just, I say that with real quotes here, just English and Hindi, uh, what happens when we look at what's being put out in Tamil or Bengali or any of the other, you know, dozens of Indian languages, how might that, and of course, no one person can do all that or even a small, small fraction. I'm just thinking more of the future, right? So when we're training the next generation of students, 
and Chinese Indian uh, comparative literature, which I don't like quite the sound of that. We need we need something that sounds better, but South, East South Asia, Asia comparative transnational, we'll, we'll, we'll get this figured out. You know, how do we advise our students, our younger scholars, anyone who has time to, to learn some more languages, how do we advise them, right? Because I don't want us to just sit with, you know, Chinese, English, and even, even just Hindi again in quotation. So, you know, how might we encourage the field um, to become more multilingual and, you know, take a closer look at work that's being uh, put out in additional, additional languages? I think some of this we see happening within Chinese studies as well, right? Where we see more interest in learning uh, ethnic minority languages and so forth. Um, Third point, and I'm inspired in this by uh, one of my students, uh, Yang Chu, who unfortunately mm -hmm. can't be with us today. I guess, yeah, you know Yang. Um, great, great individual um, who's working on uh, 20th century China-India connections in the diaspora, in his case, in Singapore. And so looking at, he, he speaks, of course, Chinese as native language and Tamil. He's you know spent years studying Tamil. So he's looking at Tamil language uh, writers, their interactions with uh, Chinese ethnic Chinese writers uh, in the context of Singapore. That's one example. I think there are many possibilities there. So I wonder where the question of diaspora might fit in if you know if we're doing like a China India kind of comparison, disconnection, and so forth. What does being outside of either China proper or um, South Asia, what does that, um, what impact does that have, right, on the kind of work we might do? And then finally, and this is, you know, I admit these are all super broad questions. That's why, you know, just think, you know, answer as, as you all see fit. Um, but as, as mentioned, I love this idea of, you know, engaging literary criticism in, you know, helping make the world perhaps a less hostile place. I mean, a lot of my work is engaged in are looking at literatures and how they're engaging with global challenges and and so forth. So this is something you know which I feel a lot of empathy and, and very much want to support. Um, I love you know the models, uh, the paradigms that that you both that you both offer us here. Um, for really looking more closely at what happens when there's open vilification of one or the other uh, parties or both, you know, when, when political situations are this terrible and literature sometimes, I think this comes out particularly out here in your work, the literature follows that, right? It's, it's, it's quite um, racist and, yeah. and so forth. So how might, or how do you envision the, um, the paradigms, the patterns, the ways of reading that you've mapped out, how do you envision that working perhaps with other literatures? I mean, I'm just thinking for my own context, East Asia, I mean, you know, we actually do see some of this, not actually quite a lot in some cases of this, this really hostile uh, writing. And you're right, sometimes we shy away from that um, it's uncomfortable to talk about, but it does need to be talked about. So just love to hear more of your thoughts on that. And my apologies for taking so much time, but um, go ahead, answer again, however, however you like. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much, Darren. Those are really productive provocations. Um, I have something to say about each of the things you raised. Um, I'm trying to, yeah, maybe I'll go through for about five minutes. We have until 5.30? We, we can extend a bit longer if necessary. Okay. Um, so your first point about the dialogue between antiquity and modernity and what to make of Chinese intellectuals' fascination with Indian antiquity or Indian mythology. Um, so the essay that I quoted, uh, the 1908 essay that I quoted Lu Xun from was in fact the Molo Shi Li Shuo. I think when we're looking at the 20th century, and I thought a lot about this while reading Girl's book, there's a tendency to 
engage with India as as though it is antiqu antiquated, mm -hmm. um, as though it is a representative of some kind of human civilization or spiritual past. And of course, that kind of idea of India has deep entrenched in Orientalist intellectual traditions. Um, and so the question for me there is, how do we study uh, the this Chinese intellectual fascination with Indian mythology while still being able to call out the kind of representational violence that occurs when India only appears as some kind of valorized civilizational spiritual past. Um, so it's incredible to see these kinds of moments. This is when you know, what I've been thinking about as disconnect really becomes perceptible to me. It's incredible to see moments in the records of cultural diplomacy from the 50s when Chinese people travel to, when Indian people travel to China, for example, and then Chinese people put on these displays of Indian mythology or like Shakuntala or these, you know, as though, you know, trying to make a really generous benevolent gesture of, look, we've been thinking about you all yeah. along. Yeah. And then there's this moment when Indian cultural delegates writing about those instances, performances, and so on, are actually like, wait, hold on, I don't recognize anything about myself in this. This is not representative of what's currently happening in China. So there's this moment where you encounter this national other in this moment of solidarity, wanting to relate, and then actually realizing that the mode of relation has been completely overdetermined by the Orientalist tradition. Um, so, Gal talks about in the book that Orientalist epistemological structure as a layer that Chinese writers pass through. And I wonder whether it is really possible to get to the other side. Yeah. Can you really pass through? Or is it an impenetrable kind of um, wall that actually blocks being able to relate? <laughs> so I was fantasizing about, it's really incredible that our books are completely different projects and completely different archives. So I don't think we discuss any of the same texts, but I could completely envision while reading the book, which was such a rich experience for me, like writing it myself, but actually writing it as disconnect. Like I can yeah. see how it actually is a story of disconnect, a complete inability to a desire, but inability to relate with the national other. Um, but yeah, this is my reading, my very subjective reading of her work. Uh, the other languages, I, I was saying to Karen earlier that it's very particular that I'm working on Hindi because the Hindi literary, linguistic history, historical linguistic relationship to China is very unique. It's very different from that in Bengali, Malayali, and so on. Mm. And so I'm interested, and also in... in um, the Chinese context, I'm looking mainly at PRC archives. So I've specifically been interested in looking at languages of, in, of exclusion, languages that have been tied to the idea of the national, that have been implicated in the national project, mm -hmm. and as a result have excluded, um, have, have become repositories where we have uh, registers of exclusion. Right. But, members. Yeah. But yeah, the, the story is very different if you look at all of the other um, South Asian languages. And um, I think for students interested in this direction, uh, probably the next logical place to go is Bengali, since Stanson has already made some inroads into those archives. Um, but regardless of, I mean, I don't... Obviously, picking up a language is incredibly hard, and the current structures of graduate studies don't allow for students to actually have the time to pick up a new language, to actually commit themselves to learning a new language. So we end up with a constantly condensed period to graduation and a rush to publication and so on. And language study is the main thing that's sacrificed in that whole process. Regardless of what languages you have access to, I think both of our books speak to how whatever language you're working in, you have to approach that language with a degree of self-reflexivity because that language has a specific history and the way in which it engages in transnational thought. And so 
for me, it's not so much about expanding the breadth of the language, but really ex expanding the depth of one's relationship to that language. Um, and one of the things I appreciate so much about Gal's book is that, you know, we take for granted that we all have access to English and we seldom think self-reflexively about what that access means. Um, the point about diaspora, I think when I think about how Disconnect could speak to multiple archives beyond China and India, how my methodological investments could extend beyond this particular case. I think diaspora is a good site in which I, I can imagine um, my methodolo methodological interventions making sense, especially because just so over the recent years, we've seen how diasporic India and diasporic Chinese populations have um, dealt with these changes going on in China and India. And I think the same could be said about diasporic, all kinds of different diasporic populations. Um, I'm thinking in particular about the way in which Indians in London celebrated out on the streets when Modi was elected, um, or any time that Modi has anything to do on TV, especially if it's cricket related. <laughs> uh, and so, I don't think the I'm interested in moments when the nation overdetermines being, and I don't think that's contingent on being present within the nation. The nation has reaches beyond the physical, its physical borders. Um, lastly, how do ways of reading, how can ways of reading um, help make the world less hostile? Um, and how do ways of reading work with other forms of expressions of hostile literature? Uh, my hope, aspiration for the book is ultimately a very practical one. Um, in the conclusion, I outline strategies that I hope are directly transplantable into all kinds of different contexts. Um, so I wrote the book, and I think one of the reasons why I had a great experience with my editor. I think one of the reasons why the cover of the book features the title is so much larger than the subtitle is because I never envisioned this book as a China India book. To me, it's always been about ways of reading, of thinking about comparison. Um, and so the, the strategies for reading that I outline in, in the conclusion, um, there are three main strategies, friction, contingency, and ellipses. And I really envision these as being directly applicable to all kinds of resonant contexts where the national others um, vilified, disavowed, or out of reach, and these moments become registered in literary expression. Great. Um, so I'll, I'll add a few, a few quick things. Um, so as, as Adira pointed out, I think that um, at least in, in my book, I do talk quite a bit about this imagination of uh, the historical past and this kind of nostalgia for, you know, uh, and, and Thompson's book also talks about that, that his book, uh, uh, the, the 2017 uh, uh, China and India uh, a Connected History. Uh, talks actually as well, and I was it was it was very helpful for me to think about you know why do people feel the need to imagine a pre-colonial past and to imagine uh, um, you know so I you know I I agree that it's it's kind of with <laughs> within the framework uh, as it stands, but it's interesting to see how some scholars like Di Tianlin you know who 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 translated Shakuntala and it was a, a very celebrated production the people who were involved in it took it very very seriously so they actually investigated um the the historical connections uh and thought about them not uh, instrumentally as oh this this is great we can be friend with India and this helps us in the world or in the new world order but Rather to think through, for example, you know, socialist literary paradigms, or um, or what is the role of art really, and how can we sort of go back to Sanskrit drama to think about it? And it's something that other scholars, such as Shudishan, have been thinking about uh, in China. So the connection between Chinese and Indi 
Chinese and Indian dramas is something that had a, a certain kind of um, heyday in the 20s and 30s. A lot of people uh, have written about this. Um, so that was constantly there, I think. Um, the uh, the kind of hearken, hearkening back to the past, uh, both in, in a very sort of facile way, but also um, the intention to study it more profoundly is there. And with uh, the establishment of institutions in China for the study of Indian languages, um, most famously the establishment of uh, at Peking University of the um, the department of uh, that Di Xianli uh, chaired, uh, and opportunities for much more serious engagement uh, presented themselves and were you know were quite um, were quite uh, prevalent. But I think um, because as Adira was talking, I was thinking about this too when I when I read her book that actually um, it, it seems you know when you. When you first look at, at our two books, it seems that they're kind of completely different. So one is about, well, they, they are very different and they use different texts and different languages, but um, they do both talk about failure uh, and about challenges. I would say more obstacles, not failure necessarily, because I think Adira too, in, in, in her book, um, what I find you know very, very important about her method uh, and inspiring is that, you know, reading for Disconnect, right, for you does not, you know, it, you don't stop at this crisis of transnationalism. You don't stop at um, the ellipses, the, 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 the silences, the, the failure, because literary expression, which I think is what we're both kind of interested in, in the way that literary expression works differently than other types of expression to to offer kind of a more profound engagement, you know, literature, right, by fiction, by its nature, engages more than one threshold of reality. Um, it has to. It's it's at the same time, it's it's telling a story that is fake, but then it asks you to believe it. So kind of by its very nature, it, it sort of invites this, what Adira calls a multiplicity um, of thinking about, about crisis. So I think that in that sense, um, these are things that you could take from both books and think about other contexts. So the, the, the topic of whether or not there were actually connections or, or they weren't, or there weren't connections is, I guess, less important because, you know, Framchand and, and Lucien did not know about each other, but, you know, the, we, sh we should still read that disconnect while thinking about relation. And in my case, these writers oft, most often did not, you know, did not read not just the original, but they also did not, did not know the people, did not read the, the other kind of work. So, you know, they didn't really understand Tagore's message. They thought they do, but does that mean that what they thought is meaningless or that isn't an utter failure? Or should we think about what it means and what this kind of mediation offers, right, for not the mediation of the nation or the mediation of hegemonic languages, how does that make us write differently and, and read differently? And so this actually, I think, I find the, uh, uh, your question, Karen, about the, the diaspora, uh, I guess, Yang Chu's question, really important. Um, and this is something that I, I, I'm just kind of beginning to think about as I'm thinking about kind of like what's next um, and about the languages as well. So I sort of, I, I say so also in my introduction, you know, I don't read Indian languages and I got, you know, this is a long story, but this book wasn't even my dissertation. I got to it through the back door. At some point I realized that it's the, the, the only interesting part of the dissertation was these two chapters. So that's what I really need to look out. And then a year and a half later, um, I, I wrote the book, but um, one way in which I'm, de I'm dealing with this uh, failure on my account to learn more Indian languages is that I've started working with collaborators. Yeah. So I'm, so that's, that's one, I guess, quick fix. Um, so I'm working now, we're in very advanced final revisions, accepted pending revisions of an article on uh, uh, Iqbal's uh, translation into Chinese. And I'm working with a graduate student I was a specialist in Urdu and uh, Persian literatures at the Institute of Islamic Studies at McGill. So it's been really great to think together and to be able to write together. That's, I guess, the, the easy fix. Uh, in the future, of course, um, it is, it is, 
ideal to have uh, uh, students kind of um, engage with this more broadly and with with questions of diaspora. Even uh, you know, you mentioned London. I'm even thinking about you know about some of the Zadie Smith's novels, right? About how to not necessarily to work on those novels, but to think through what happens when um, you know when immigrants come with their own baggage and their own language and cultural background. How did like that situation of interaction and disconnect is super fascinating to to explore um kind of i guess beyond the nation but also in a, in a different nation um so yeah i guess i think that's what I've, i'll say at this point thank that's you that's great thank you both so much and I'd like now to open the floor to questions maybe we can take a couple questions and then um answer them together because we are running a little short on time. We figured we got about 540. Just to give you all time to some questions, share some thoughts. Yeah. I'll just start off. Uh, I think Urdu is, is uh, quite important uh, with regard to languages uh, and, and to disrupt some of the things that, that you were saying about uh, relay translation and translation to other languages because there was in 1920s a Chinese way uh, student mm -hmm. who went to Aligarh Right, uh, and he wrote a book called Chinese Muslim, uh, which is about uh, uh, Islam in, in China, yeah. uh, which is really quite agree. fascinating to see. And and this is where Nile Green's uh, recent book actually comes in and adds to what you what you are saying. But uh, to to Adira, you know, the issue of violence. Uh, you talked about state, right? I mean, a nation state uh, appearing in poems and and literature, but also how about Chinese people? Uh, you see the transition happening from uh, Mahadevi Burma's uh, Teeny Periwala, which became the movie, uh, to the Bollywood representation of Chinese people, right? Uh, do you see that as a concern because it actually became a violent affair when the Indians uh, attacked the Chinese in India based on how the Bollywood was depicting the Chinese people? Uh, and and, uh, and and the stories about how Chinese people cannot be trusted. One is, of course, the nation state. Uh, the violence there is a different kind of a violence, but the violence there is connected to the diaspora, the Chinese diaspora in uh, in India, and where the violence comes in through uh, not only literature, but also newspaper and Bollywood, different media. So how do you see that violence um, uh, as well? Uh, and, and, and for Gao, uh, I, I think the post-colonial uh, hegemony through the Russian uh, literature, which is part of the, the relay thing, right? I mean, in mm -hmm. the 50s, uh, a lot of Indian stuff uh, is translated through Russian. Mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. um, so what kind of, uh, or is it some kind of a hegemony that, that we can also, uh, also think about uh, colonial or post-hegemonic? What about the role of Russia in, in all this, or Soviet Union? And there's lots of things, I mean, performance, movies, our, our, our this are coming through Soviet Union. So what kind of relaying is that? Right, so I'll just, I'll just be very quick. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a recent article that came out, super interesting on uh, relay translation in Soviet cinema and in the film festivals in, in Tashkent. So it was, it's it's certainly, um, I mean, really translation on its own is, is a topic that has kind of recently began to be taken more seriously. And in the 50s, um, it was huge, right? Because what, you know, all of these third, third world countries wanna speak to each other. Um, Russian, for my, at least from, from the periods that I was looking, most people read it, I think, in English translation. And I, 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 it could be that I just, you know, haven't looked at some of these things. So I can't speak to that specifically. But it is interesting to, to and, and it's certainly important to look at, um, at sort of the Soviet center, uh, not just in terms of the Russian language, but in terms of the, the modes of circulation and the institutions that kind of enable connections and encounters. And that's that's something that um, I don't think I've I've seen. Um, so, you know, maybe one of your students can do it. Yeah. I see Emily's hand and then Xiaolu, who's done a tremendous amount of work on relay translation. So Emily first, why don't you ask, and then Xiaolu, and then we'll answer the two questions together. Uh, 
So I was thinking about this comment that Gal made about how Ji Xian Lin worked really hard to do the translation. And that was a, a theme that came up, I think, a lot in your discussion today about how people put a lot of effort into trying mm -hmm. to do a good job, like same just and I'm curious, like, how we can relate that to what Vera was saying in terms of, like, this parody and, like, mm -hmm. poor translation and how the sort of quality of effort or per performance of effort itself mm -hmm. has meaning and how it itself mm -hmm. impacts this either connect or disconnect that ultimately comes out of the lift grade production. So I have several thoughts. So one thing is uh, um, about the model that you propose the um self known status. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you have any comments on the Chinese concept of form form to be himself and uh, it's certainly not the Western Orientalism, this is the Chinese proposal uh, that sort of uh, pulled um on um, several of the like geographically like India, China, Japan and uh, well the, the, the concept is uh, like shift Shifted uh, over time, but uh, um, um, somehow, like the Chinese were ha have been very much into this this idea um, until even the twenty first century. There were a lot of books about um, Dong Fang Wen Xie actually, and Ji uh, um, was considered to be the founder of of, of uh, that. Um, and uh, um, um, and and I would say like it's especially in terms of the Soviet influence. Um, um, many of the early discourses actually are kind of uh, based on the Soviet interpretation mm -hmm. of, uh, of this kind of relationship. But sort of uh, recently, I think that the Chinese, the, the Chinese took it over and have their own. They have their own imagination about it. So um, um, I, I just wonder, like, is, uh, beyond the model of South and North South, like if we put say the Soviets into the picture, like whether uh, we, we might have. Mm -hmm. a, Complicated or more interesting um, model to understand this concept. And this is one thing. The other thing that just just because of the the quotes that you uh, included, uh, uh, so many truths uh, wording. Um, it sounds uh, there were a lot of phrases like Buddhist phrases that mm -hmm. um, that use and and I wonder how much to what extent actually the Chinese already internalized some of the Indian mm -hmm. wisdom. And so, um, because I have been struggling with the issue of uh, Japanese versus Chinese, and how to what extent I can say that this is actually Chinese and versus this is actually Japanese. So, so I'm just wondering, like, would the Chinese face the same issue when we talk about, say, the Indi Indian culture, right? Like, um, because of the whole um, Buddhist uh, reception history, and uh, um, but do they even realize it when they are talking about it and using it because it's already part of Chinese language at that point? You want to start responding to everything? Um, I think Fan Sen's question was really important because the nation state is one institution of several institutions that make up how people interact with cultural forms, and institutions by their very design have uh, benevolent and insidious motivations. Um, and yeah, I think examining uh, the Bollywood industry or the film indie industry or um, the publishing industry from that perspect perspective of an institution uh, is very fruitful. Um, I think you're right in, although you didn't frame it exactly like this, in um, picking up on how when we talk about culture, sometimes it's often thought of as automatically subversive uh, or automatically having the potential to be subversive against dominating structures. Um, and I think my work is interested in complicating that idea and embedding or identifying centers of power that emerge when those overarching hegemonic structures are rapided away. Um, I really like Emily's question about effort versus economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> it may look like March Way, this guy is just being lazy, but what he's done, especially with the parody, is an incredibly artful thing. And Shamshir himself, uh, when he published in 59, this poem that he had been working on 
for many years prior in the preface to that poetry collection, he talks about how long he spent writing those 126 words. So this is an intense labor over something that is supposed to then appear as economical. Uh, and then for Shamsher to be able to change the completely flip the meaning of that poem on its head with just 20 words, that is an intensification of labor. Um, and so I don't think that Machve is being flippant about anything. And even in his mistranslations, I think it's still a little bit tongue in cheek, given that Machve has been part of this poetic group. He's been friends with Shamsher, he's published in the same publications as many of these modernist poets. Um, and so he has the sensibility of wanting to play with words, wanting to think about signification. And all of that is incredibly labor intensive. Um, and I just want to say, uh, sorry, I didn't catch your name. Xiaolu. 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 Um, about the internalized Buddhism. I really like that point. Mm. Um, Uh, yeah, I think it's really important to, to think about how we risk retrospectively creating an other Trinity. when um, it reminds me in a way of the, the ways in which we often see the peripheries, the ethnic peripheries come up in Han literature. Um, where there's a kind of appropriative gesture towards internalization or whether there's a, a kind of rever reverence or admiration for a certain culture that in itself has this appropriative gesture. Um, and I wondered if it made me think about whether that applied to this context, thinking about internalized Buddhism, um, especially for someone like Sumanshu who's thinking explicitly about right. ideas of India. Um, does he really like how, is he really aware of how much he's internalized and how much he himself is constructing of some kind of construct of an other that doesn't actually exist? Yeah, so I'll re I'll respond really quickly uh, also. Um, I guess I'll respond first to the internalized uh, uh, Buddhism question. Um, I, I do, uh, like in the book, I, I analyze this long story. Uh, well, it, it's short. It just took me a long time to read it because the, the late Qing Chinese was really hard and it was full of uh, Buddhist illusions, which I had to kind of dissect. So I, I totally agree with you in the sense that, you know, at, at some point is every reference to Buddhism a reference to India? No, of course not. I mean, these people are, you know, are imbued in it and he's also a Buddhist monk. Uh, and 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 trained um, in that. Um, there are also terms that are not Buddhist, um, and the person who's actually uh, working and and finishing a book on uh, Buddhism in modern Chinese literature very seriously is is uh, someone called Ying Lei, who teaches at Amherst, if you know, and she's also examining India and Japan, um, which is which is really a blind spot of my book. Uh, to um, return to your previous question, so. I, I, I look at the uh, South North South in a very sort of particular context and the kind of people I cite and the question of English as a hegemonic language is what I was interested in for this book. But I mean, absolutely your 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 critique stands and this had been uh, told to me by others like Nico Voland who has recently published a, a volume with uh, Duke University Press on global China's who looks at Russian uh, as a mediating language in the fifties and does a great job. And of course, another blind spot is, is Japan. I mean, the, Japan was so important for the China-India connection, especially through Buddhism. So this is something Tanzan has been telling me a lot. And you may think I've ignored him, but no, actually I have read about it and cited it, but there was just, there was just, it was just not possible to kind of do all of it. But it, it's, yeah, that's kind of where I guess there's more work to do. And where relay translation is 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 certainly not just one or two hegemonic languages. I mean, French was also super important and German, uh, especially in the fifties. Yeah. Okay, folks, we are seriously running out of time, but I see a hand there, and I think on online we have we have a bunch, but maybe we can take one question online. Maybe we can maybe the question can be posed, and then you can have just like literally twenty seconds each, and then at least we'll have some 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 participation. Okay. Too. So yeah, just just one question, uh, just because uh, she is from NYU, 
Uh, is asking what happens post 62 when the leftists are calling for militarization of, of, of India and nationalism. Uh, so what, what emerges in the literary form with regard to individual political leaning, leanings of the left and the calls for nationalism that they are I mean, you see that in city and city So so do you see that kind of a conflicting thing emerging in the literary of the left in India? Um, yes, for sure. There's a lot of, in Bengali literature, there's a lot of mourning. Um, I was recently, well, I was recently supposed to teach, but then decided not to because it was a very complex, a Bengali novel by uh, Navarun Bhattacharya, who is the son of Mahashweta Devi, who you may have heard of. Mm -hmm. um, he's kind of a cult favorite. Uh, and he, he, one of his best known novels is basically this kind of, pay in to Maoism in the Bengali left context. So there's definitely afterlives of thinking about China, thinking about Maoism um, in all sorts of different Indian cultural contexts. That's great. Okay, well, I would love to continue this conversation, but unfortunately we are way over time. Thank you, Tadira, to Gal, to our amazing audience, to Tansen, so to Arnav for oh, bringing us you. together, Mark, managing technology. Everyone in this room, your questions, those online, and uh, have a good rest of the day, everyone. And if you don't so apply, uh, please grab one on your way up as a discount.